Welcome back. Now, Mr. President um, has, uh, on the 18th of April, which was on Thursday, um, signed into law the new minimum wage. Uh, 30,000 Naira is now what it is. And um, we're going to be talking about it right now, looking at the possibilities of <laughs> sustaining this. We know all the drama that went with uh, a lot of our state governments in the past with regards to paying, uh, paying salaries uh, when it was 18,000 Naira. So uh, how sustainable is this? Do we uh, look forward to greater times ahead for Nigerian workers. I have here with me Lena Debute to help me dissect this. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Emuka. Is this realistic? In terms of being able to fund... Um, the payment. The payment. Okay, so to be clear, right, this isn't a wage increase. It's a minimum wage increase. So the first question you want to ask is, what proportion of the civil service even qualifies for the minimum wage? See, the entire federal civil service is less than 90,000 people. Uh, state governments recruit, uh, apart from Kano, that has 185,000, and Lagos, that is 100,000. Everybody else is around the 50,000 range. So it's not a multitude of workforce they employ. And everybody from, everybody from level 6, step 14 downwards, are the only people that qualify for this minimum. Every other person's pay is already above that pay grade. So when... We begin to concentrate on their ability to pay. We seem to amplify the issues around how much it is that this proportion is worth anyway. So I think the larger question should be what should the, 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 the working staff deserve? Oh, it's they, not they, deserving, they, of course. They, Everybody knows this. The mason that works for me takes 1,200 naira a day. That's over 31,000 naira in a month already. That's my definition of minimum wage, what a completely unskilled person should earn fairly. So the private sector already has been paying above the minimum wage since forever. Why should we be bothered about the government's ability to pay when they are making budgets and they have high overheads, doing other things that aren't as beneficial to the people? So how do we ensure that this happens? I mean, we can, we can speak all the English we want, but we know what has happened in this country where state governments swore that it could, we have, we've had bailouts from the federal government. How do we, as Nigerians, you know, sort of make this, make sure that this is paid? And like you said, I know it, it's not supposed to affect senior civil servants, mm -hmm. but was the guarantee that it won't? Because, I mean, if this guy comes up and his salary is closer to mine, why don't I demand that mine also goes up? How do we also make sure that these things work out effectively. Well, but those, that, that, that's a separate argument to have, whether it's going to cause an agitation for further wage rises. Yeah. I don't think that's going to come up. But for God's sake, this is a law now. Okay? Yeah. If we're in a country where we are worried about the executive arm of government's ability to implement what has become law in the land, then we have real issues. I thought that that was all the analysis that would have happened in the background. No wonder, you know, PwC came up with you know, speculations around um, probable increase in pay as you earn to help fund the, you know, this wage increase and all of that. All of those conjectures happening around probably removal of subsidies so that government can have more free cash flow to do all of these things. Those speculations for me had the problem. I don't want to be the Nigerian worrying about how the government is going to pay people that have worked for them. Nobody worries for me when I have to pay my own staff, okay? So if you don't need that staff, you let them go. If you have a wage bill that you cannot sustain and you, still, you also have redundancy, then you deal with the inefficiency in your system. If you have people that have worked, they deserve to be paid. I just see that happening, reducing the inefficiencies, because I feel like every day, or sorry, at least every, once a year, at least mm. a year, or so, so, so number of ghost workers have been on, on, on sort of found out. You know, this is sort of an ongoing conversation. No, but let me civil see service reforms, ghost workers. Do you think those things are going to be realistically tackled? Let me take the, uh, the new rate and situate it in some context for you. The first time we had this kind of negotiation was, was in 1990. It was 3,000 naira. The dollar was seven, seven, seven naira something, you know? Yeah. In real terms, that was 140,000 naira if you, if you adjust for, for present day exchange rate. Forget about inflation now. If you adjust for inflation, it's even more. Then we had an increase under Abdul Salam to, um, was it, uh, no, Basanjo to 7,500. The first was Abdul Salam. That in today's rate is about 19K. So after 11 years, 1990 to 2001, the workers' real earnings reduced in real terms 
significantly by over 90%. Jonathan did an increase in 2015 to the, to the 18,000. In today's dollar rate, that's 32,000 naira. Then we make an increase from 18K to 30K. In real terms, the, the, the guy lost 2K. So really, and the definition of absolute poverty by international standards is once you're living on under $3 a, a day, you're poor. So we moved from people that were absolute, we moved them, promoted Nigerians from absolutely poor to absolutely poor. And we want to worry about how we are going to keep them absolutely poor. That, for me, is unconscionable from any government. So I, I, I don't think, the, I, I think the government needs to do everything, not just to be able to afford this pay, but to be able to adjust the minimum wage to a point where it is consistent with our current realities. See, in other countries where things work, minimum wage is a way to regulate the private sector from shortchanging their the people. Workers, yeah. In Nigeria, it's is the reverse. It is the government that is regulating itself. That tells you that there is a government that does not work for the people here. If we have to come on air and worry about how a government is going to move people from absolutely poor to absolutely poorer. Are there any positives looking at this now, looking at the next four years of this government? Because people have said, oh, if he's going to do this when he's already won his second term and he's still looking out for workers and all of that, what's the significance of this with regards to whatever the government might be planning or whatever their policies might be in the next four years? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. This is where all the conspiracy theories start coming in. What's the ulterior motive here? Is this a sweetener? Because there's really no political incentive to do this anymore. Is this a sweetener for some other things? This is why when we start listening to Kachiku telling us about landing cost of petrol being 180, we begin suspicious. to wonder whether because of 40,000 federal staff that will be affected by this minimum wage, Nigeria is going to penalize 111 million workers. You know, that is why we begin to wonder about the speculation around increasing the VAT, around increasing the pay as you earn. And some of us sit here, today Nigeria takes 25% of what you earn as taxes, and I say to myself, with what I see, does this country deserve a quarter of my sweat? Okay? I'm from Benue State, and I just came from Benue State. Payee is a state-controlled tax, for example. I don't have light in my village. Do I want to pay tax to a government that will not give me light? I don't have roads in Otupo that is the headquarter. Do I, do I want to pay tax to a government so that will not give me roads? Any, so, so what I'm sensing here is, unless the government and they have denied that there is no ulterior motive, they are not increasing anything and all of that, if that then is true, then I can say this is a positive trend. I can say that maybe this government wants to listen and this government will look for opportunity to do even more. But if any of these things happen, any of this potential reduction in the disposable income of 100 and mil 111 million people that don't have absolutely no benefit from this whole tax regime happen, then that is stealing. Because you want to take money from 11, 11, 111 million people so you can sort out salary differentials for less than 40,000 people. If that is not daylight robbery, I don't know what is. Okay. I think we're going to end it on that note. Thank you very much, Leonard. We're going to, I mean, it's an ongoing conversation. Like you said, we're going to keep watching because this government is going to be in power for another four years. Hopefully, these uh, reforms continue positively and um, it doesn't end up being, like you said, a sweetener for maybe harsher days to come. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Ebuka. Like always, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at YNHR TV. is the handle. The hashtag to follow is Robin Mines. You can also visit the website, YNHR.TV. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next Sunday. Yeah.